Pop up submissions live, all the thrill of the red carpet with none of the slapdowns. At least, I think. It depends if Bev gets angry with me or not. Uh, on today's live show, we bring you from halfway round the world. Yes, it's the utterly fabulous Lee Murray, doyen of fantasy and horror writing. I always think that word doyen has got something to do with paper serviettes. Uh, I really must look it up before <laughs> I use it again. But before then, please allow me to present you with a nearly legendary Bev Dalton. And after this show, she probably will be totally legendary because, well, it's going to be that kind of show. Straight into the first submission. We don't hang around. It's called Gun Barrel Highway. I want you to let me know what you think of that. Do you like that title? If you're watching live on YouTube yeah. now, express your opinion. We've already got some approval from, I think that was Lee. I'm not sure. We'll find yeah. out in a minute. It's Suspense Thriller. It's from Sean. There's a QR code there too, so you can go straight away to Sean's website. I'm going to read you Sean's blurb. Texas trophy wife, Claudia Grant dies after she causes an early morning car accident. In the other vehicle, Daniel Morrison, an attorney struggling with a pending divorce and pill addiction, panics and leaves the scene. Hayden Grant, the victim's husband and a corrupt politician. Oh, there's a full stop there. I was expecting a verb somewhere. Oh. Uh, Hayden Grant, the victim's husband and a corrupt politician. He capitalizes on the tragedy and places a million dollar bounty on Morrison dead or alive. Daniel's on the run with his friends, family, along with the entire state of Texas out to collect the jackpot. Let me tell the world about you, Sean. Uh, Sean is the author of On the Bayou, 1134 and Roll of the Die. He produced and directed two documentaries in the Caribbean. Out of many, one struggle for education about school kids getting a second chance in Kingston, Jamaica, and 2020 Vision, a look at the development of a global financial hub in Port of Spain. Um, that's Trinidad. Um, he's, he's a Stephen King dollar baby. Okay, I understand that. Uh, with his award-winning audio production of One for the Road. He's a two-time Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. I told you it's going to be Oscar heavy today. A Nickel Award-winning screenwriter. And he's worked on projects with Robert Rodriguez, Troublemaker Studios. A spike, isn't it? He started Audible Parade in the Texas Hill Country. They created Triple Six, a Las Vegas-based serial audio thriller. That sounds like something I'd like to listen to, I assume that the uh, QR code link you've given us will take us straight to that. Meanwhile, while I do that, I'm going to leave you in the more than capable hands of Martin. Gun Barrel Highway by Sean, read by Martin. You look like shit. His reflection didn't respond and just stared back at him as he squinted under the harsh fluorescence. It wasn't the light that bothered him, but the hangover pulsating at his temples as his razor slid across his chin and cleaned up the patch of shaving foam along his neck. He couldn't remember the last time he drank so much and it really kicked into high gear for the past week. They were getting to the end of the line, but not quite there yet. Tensions frayed on both sides. They both tried to mask it, keeping a paper thin cordiality truce between each other. A store supply of liquor kept the dam from bursting. So far. All that was really left was to just go through the motions. They were pretty much finished with the dissection of the house, their home. Memories in the past and a true love that once was. Now just another itemised checklist. They already went from room to room claiming this and that. Words and feelings were cordial for the most part. He lost track of how many cardboard boxes he assembled, how many rolls of packing tape he'd used. All the damn packing. Is it too heavy? Is it too light? Will it all fit? Then the trips began back and forth to the storage unit. The contract he signed said the first month was free and he scribbled his signature, wondering how many more months of limbo would he need after that. 
all the necessary munitiae shrouding the big question. They were inching closer to a clean break. He managed a little smile at himself in the bathroom mirror. Sure, he might look like death warmed over, but he was actually proud of how well he and Judy were handling all of this here at the end. No real fights to speak of, although Judy never called them that. She'd play her little word games and talk semantics and call what they were doing an argument or a discussion, which made things even worse. And their voices would rise and the anger would just boil and spill out all over again. He'd seen it with friends and even family over the years. Times like these can be downright dirty until you both manage to make it to the handover, the keys and close the door for good end. Divorce could be a skip and a jump down the yellow brick road or a never ending slog like the Batan death march. It was not quite the world of Oz with Judy, but he had to admit the liquor helped. And at the end of these blurred together heavy days, a bottle always waited for them. The good scotch was the first to go. She preferred the maker's mark some client gave her for Christmas. The tequila went fast. There was a lot about Judy that Daniel just couldn't handle anymore, and he was certain she would say the same. But even he would readily admit his wife, well, soon to be his ex-wife, whatever the proper title was now, she sure could whip up some frozen margaritas. They discovered it by accident, accident on a trip to Cancun from some much better days ago. Daniel had taken bartending classes back before law school, took front and centre, he was hazy on the breakdown for a lot of drinks, but he knew what went into his frozen strawberry margarita. Judy wasn't even sure how to work the blender. Daniel wanted to help, but she was adamant that she could do it all herself. She wasn't buying that as she, he watched her scurry about their cosy rental kitchen. The end result looked pretty good, but the taste test didn't lie. Her mix was the clear winner and so much better. Daniel didn't even try to argue the point. She said it was her secret ingredient, and he believed her. They laughed and danced throughout the hotel room and even made love on the balcony late into the night. He smiled at the memory in the mirror. Always a good reading from Martin, always a great way to start the show. So let me just tell you, because uh, we're live and all kinds of crap happens when we're live, we're not picking up all the... Um, um, words of wisdom from the genius room. Uh, just a slight technical issue there. We're getting some, but we're not getting all of them by any means. So what I'm going to do is just spend a little bit, a uh, little bit longer, going through their comments and reactions. Which is, you know, one of the great things about puppet submissions. Really, it's it's sort of live sentiment analysis in real time. You've never had it before. So let's take it from the title. Carol. Carol says, I like the title, evocative. Uh, Barbara says, the blurb needs a bit of an edit. Yeah, it does because I, I stumble over that a bit. Um, title works, says Matt. Edit the blurb, though. And he says, interesting idea, but a little clunky. Blurb needs a tweak, says James. Uh, L.A. Tom screws with that. Blurb, short and sweet, says Carol. Reminds me of The Fugitive. Yeah, actually. Decent title, says Johnny, for the genre. I like that title, personally. Jeff has just joined as a Zuku. Uh, no, asks a technical question, which I think has been answered. Annie likes the font. It is a bit retro, isn't it? But I quite like that, actually. It's Curry, says Johnny. It takes him back to radio stuff. Um, screenplay font, actually. Yeah, possibly Barbara. Um, Matt says, getting to the end of the line, this is quite getting to the end of the line, but not quite there yet, is a nice hook line. Tense issues, says L.A. Thomas. Um, Annie says, writing's nice, but it's not really living up to the blurb. I like the arc, says Matt, but it's a bit early to be taking the side trips. No emotions, says James. No action. And Jeff says, a little self-indulgent feels it needs to get to the story. I want more than internal dialogue, says Pamela Jo. I do too, actually. And Eva says, if it wasn't for the blurb, I would have got lost at the beginning. And Christina says, I like the point of view and the focus on all the alcohol shows what's important to him at the moment. And Johnny says, mm, not grabbing me, although... Competent writing. Competent writing. Okay, well, you know what? I think we need to hear from Bev. Well, I I liked the economy of the writing in many ways. And there was a, a particular line that I loved. These blurred together heavy days, I thought, 
was really lovely. But I found it um, rather clinical and a bit distancing. And I think that's because it was all tell and backstory. And I felt it needed to be interspersed with things actually happening. I mean, if she was mixing up the cocktails or they were actually packing. And I also found um, the point of view shift a little odd because at the moment at the beginning he seemed to be talking to himself so i assumed we were in his head and and he's saying you look like shit to his reflection and then he suddenly talked about they and i thought what him and his reflection who's they where did they come from and it suddenly panned out and they were and it it took until the second page before i realized he was talking about they him and his wife Mm. um so it was it was slightly disjointed and then he said, you had no real fights. But then he talked about voices rising in anger and boiling out. And, and it was like, well, that's a fight. So I, I think um, I had maybe put it aside for a little while, have a think about it, because I think there's some, it's got some legs, but it felt slow after the promise of the burp, blurb. I know. The blurb said, said there's going to be a car accident yeah. and you're going to be on the run and there's a pill addiction and this, that. And then it was like a man shaving in a mirror um it it didn't feel as dynamic as the blurb and it for me it was a little it just felt a bit slow after that promise and i kind of wanted it to move more yeah i did i i couldn't agree more i mean i thought that um i was excited i thought i thought i like the title and i like the concept Mm -hmm. and i just wanted to get into it more but let's see what lee thinks Lee thinks what everybody else thinks. I think the genius room, and I think Bev basically summed it up perfectly. Um, this, the title is really is really um, pithy, and it felt like a thriller with a sort of Western vibe, you know, um, yeah. gangstery. And and I thought, yep, that sounds like a, a great fast paced, um, you know, novel that I want to read on the plane. Absolutely. Um, and and then the blurb sort of said that too. There's an accidental killing, and and he goes on the run, um, and the pe- and people for some reason are after him. And I just thought, oh well, that sounds exciting. And then we get totally. yeah. you know this, yeah, look in the mirror, and um, yeah, and a sort of personal reflection, which I think is still valid. You know, it just doesn't need to go there. I want to start at the you know the screech of metal. I think let's let's start there, and the panic that he gets into immediately because he's half you know, cut when it happens and then we'll have a story. And this yeah. personal reflection can certainly happen, you know, two days down the track when he's looking in some hotel room mirror and um, wondering how he got here. Perhaps that's the place for this reflection. So I think perhaps, yeah, um, uh, there are a few little tense issues, but overall the writing was reasonably sound. I just, it's just not the story you promised us. Um, yeah. So Sean, and certainly Sean has the cred to get this off. You know, he knows what okay. makes a thriller. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, he's done this work in audio, so he knows what people need to hear um, and what will get them hooked. So I just think he needs to maybe think about, you know, where he's starting the story. I think you need to start right in the action for an action story if you can, you Sean. Know, um, and, yeah, uh, yeah otherwise, I mean, otherwise. This is, uh, this is not, sorry to interrupt, Lee. I know we've got about a second lag between here and... New Zealand, um, but this is not unusual for pop-ups, is it? I mean, it does happen, but we get really interesting concept. We get very excited about it, and it turns out that the author maybe is starting in the wrong place. They're kind of writing themselves into it, and we don't really care about that. We just want to get into the thick of the action. We just want the thrills. Yeah. Okay, so you're yeah. nodding, but you're not saying anything because this does go out as an audio podcast. So, you know, what, <laughs> nodding is just going to be like five seconds of silence. Like no one, no one wants to talk to Peter anymore. I totally agree with you, Peter. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Oh, Lee, see why, why I love you so much. Um, let's see what the genie is saying. Zuki says, if I was coming at this as a reader, I'd be immediately put off by the poor editing. For me, a huge part of my trust in the writer at the beginning is a hook missing. Um, and the craft, mercy. And PC Frontier says, I think Sean writes quite well. 
But the start is a bit of a cliche and a bit tame. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted more intensity, actually. It's my word of the day, that. Uh, is this the right place to start? I think the best place for a thriller to start is with some action. Uh, yeah, thriller. Looks, uh, Bev's bang on the money, says Annie. Matt says, Bev is on it here. Thrillers should open with thrills. And John says, I think the drinks thing were, um, was about good memories. Not a guy that remembers Sunset, but discovering new drinks it is a sweet memory. Uh, LA says, mm -hmm. I think they scrapped the quiz. Oh, no, that's a, that's a, that's a down to a technical issue. James says, you must have proofreaders before submitting to anyone. Anywhere, or they will throw into the slush bar. And Matt says, it had a bit of Elmore Leonard. I thought that. Yeah, that's, that's perceptive. Mm. Uh, feel of the blur, but the opening didn't go with that. And Mel says, solid advice from both Bev and Lee. Good. All right. I hope you're pleased with that, uh, Sean. We have to tell it like it is, but I, for one, love your title. We don't often get titles I get really keen on, but I am keen on that, and I like the promise. And um, you know what? I mean, if you want to, send us in um, a, a redraft as and when you do it. I suggest leaving about three months, actually, because uh, that will allow people's memories to fade a little bit, and they'll see it. With fresh eyes, let's look at the numbers. You've got a solid 62. 62, which is a good start for this show. Let's see what's next. I'll tell you what is next, actually. Lee Murray is next. Because we don't normally cut to our featured guest quite so early on. But there's a lot to talk about with you, um, as always. But particularly so at the moment. Um, everyone knows who, who, who Lee is. I'm going, I'm going to put that up so people can, you know, if you happen to be watching this for the first time, you're Lee Murray, Lee Murray. Lee Murray is big. Uh, horror writer, fantasy writer, just a terrific all-rounder, all actually. A doyen, which I, I've just learned is not a uh, paper napkin, which I'm very pleased. A doily. <laughs> it's, a, it's a doily, isn't it? Yes, it's doily. quite different. It's entirely different. <laughs> yeah, but you are, you are a horror writer and you've got, no end of awards. In fact, you'll see in the description here, I think Kate very sensibly didn't actually put the numbers in because each time you come on, you keep on getting another one. Uh, the uh, Bram Stoker Awards. <laughs> so we just, we, just, we just say she's got lots of them. Um, but one thing that all is, of them. Is, is, you know, all, <laughs> I can't do that. But what you are up, this is very interesting, right? So you've got this, um, this piece. I went up on Medium and it's uh, on another website too, but... Medium is a good place to, to find Lee. Medium.com uh, slash at Lee Kiwi. There's two words, but squash them together. I thought this was fascinating, actually. I don't read horror and other weird tales, right? So it's it's worth reading. It's it's an essay. Um, it's shortlisted, actually, for a Bram Stoker Award, isn't it? It was interesting. I didn't realise they did that, but it, it's actually short, it's, shortlisted. Yeah. Um, may it's I new. Just... It's very new that that new short fiction um, category because that is, yeah interesting yeah. So let me just let me just read an extract because I think it's so interesting what, what you're writing here. This is a, a small extract from this essay. It's well worth reading. It won't take you very long. Writing horror as an act of subversion. Lee writes, uh, its transgressive underpinnings mean horror welcomes fresh approaches from new voices, including LGBTQ, disabled, indigenous and diasporic narratives. Horror creatives are a diverse group with weird and innovative tastes. Another reason people might distance themselves from horror, because if they embrace the macabre, it might imply that they too are weird. Wow. <laughs> Just how how weird are you? Oh, very weird. <laughs> I have a funny story about that because the first time I ever went to a horror convention, um, I was sat, I was seated at the banquet next to Kelly Lehman, who is Richard Lehman's um, daughter. And um, you, I don't know if you know, but Richard Lehman is a very big, um, sort of a big name in horror and he, he had died recently. Um, so this was about 2016 or 2015. And I so I actually got seated next to Richard Lehman's ashes. It's the only time I've ever oh been goodness. to a banquet <laughs> with a dead person. So that wow. was really interesting. But That's you know, so that, I kind of felt it's weird, but I, it felt right <laughs> in some way. Yeah. Oh, so, yes. Well, Lex is just so don't say weird like it's a bad thing. He's bristling. <laughs> it's, 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 it's normal. It's normal. I just, let me just ask you one um, serious question, then we'll get on to the next submission because we've got four more today. All right. So, 
power up, you know, I mean, so often, I may be in the past, but uh, maybe in the present too, when women are the victims of horror, you know, in the narrative, um, they're depicted as helpless, um, violated, stuff like that. I mean, are you comfortable with that? Yeah, there's a kind of move away from that trope um, to give women more agency. That's that whole final girl sort of, um, you know, sort of idea that uh, Carol Glover brought around, brought about, and most of us know that, um, you know, that if you survive, you you need to be virginal, you need to be a certain yes. type of person, yes. and we're, we're moving away from that in horror to explore more authentic narratives. So, um, so yeah, there's a there's a whole big move, and it's, it's Women in Horror Month at the moment, um, and, you know, there's some amazing stuff out there by, you know, contemporary women writers writing horror, um, because it is subversive and it's the place mm. to explore new ideas. So definitely, you know, have a look around and see who's out there. Um, there's a number of, of great blog posts at the moment listing, you know, who you should be reading and there's some really fresh voices out there. So definitely have a look around and expand your sort of your diet, your literary diet and see what's out there. Very cool. Christine says, ah, Lee, everyone's weird and I finally come to an age where I'm comfortable with my weirdness. That's good, yeah. Good for you. Absolutely good for you. Let's look at uh, <laughs> the next submission. We're going to come back and we've got lots more to talk about uh, with Lee. Here we go. Submission number two today comes from Nicole. I wonder if you're with us, Nicole. If you are, give us a wave on YouTube, please. Say hello. And remember, you can tell us what you think of what we're saying about your manuscript. You can review us. It's called The Curtain Realm. It's middle grade fantasy. And this is your blurb. Samich is getting ready to leave the realm of imagination and comfort toys behind, ready for secondary school. When she turns 11 and receives an invitation to become the protector of the magical curtain realm. <sighs> okay, so I'm struggling with that sentence. So when she turns 11 and receives an invitation to become the protector of the magical curtain. It's the same person writing these blurbs today. <laughs> Does the quote work for me? A house moves, a house move, a house moves nearly ruins everything. A house move nearly ruins everything. But what kid will say no to the chance of being a magical secret agent, especially if she can bring her bestie along on the adventure? Together they explore other worlds, get trapped, meet magical creatures, save water sprites, fight goblins. Oh, what's not like to like about that? I love it. Um, I am a debut writer, says Nicole, based on the edge of the Peak District, that's uh, right in the middle of the UK, really. Um, with my husband and daughter, I started writing in late 2020, doing a Faber and Faber Start Your Novel in Five Days workshop. Okay, we're promoting Faber and Faber's workshops, are we? How much they cost? Actually, I'd be interested to know. Um, delivered by an Australian author, Catherine Heyman. Subsequently, Catherine, through her work with Australian writing uh, mentors, became my mentor. Uh, whilst I spent a thoroughly enjoyable year developing these characters and exploring this world. In previous lives, I floated through jobs from fruit picking to holiday rep, car hire manager to a career as an academic researcher, writing for academic publications and reports. So you've had wide ranging experience, which I think is actually the bedrock for, for, for writers, really. More recently, I've supported and taught children and teenagers of all ages. Okay, so we have a real treat for you today. Uh, it's one of our great team of uh, narrators. Let me just show you. Yeah, voice.latopia.com. You can go to that now. You can find out all about our crack team of narrators. And you can hire one of them or more if you want. A two-voice audio book. Why not? Why don't you do that? Um, so that's voice.latopia.com. Go to that. But not until you've experienced this reading from K. The Curtain Realm by Nicky Crompton Read by Kay Chapter 1 Party Prep Clara positioned herself right at the back corner of the shop, squished her eyes tight shut and tried to channel judgy 11-year-old. You know the one, the mean person that every successful pre-teen drama series has. Note 1 Usually this character is the one who discovers the main character's secret diary and uses it to shame them. 
Opening her eyes, she scanned the shop, trying to imagine what someone might see as they walked in for the first time, and what out of that she could fix up. Even with magic, there were limits. First things first, let's give the place a good clean. Clara hated cleaning. Such a hateful, repetitive task. Yes, okay, it was lovely straight afterwards, but every day after that was just another day closer to needing another clean. Note 2. There is a school of thought that if you do not clean for seven years, it won't get any dirtier. Warning. Attempts to prove this can lead you to becoming homeless. Your house now belongs to the dust mites and bacteria. Luckily, she had some friends who felt differently. Clara walked over to the arched opening at the back of the shop. In a practiced action, she smoothly reached under the thick burgundy folds of one of the curtains that somewhat theatrically framed each side of the opening. Her hand easily found the smooth coolness of the black rectangular panel hidden behind the heavy velvet. A fancy swish came from the panel as it read the details of her hand. The ugly wooden beaded curtain that dropped down behind its burgundy frame pixelated and transformed into a throbbing glow of energy. Clara readied herself for what was to come, then repeated the ancient words she had become so familiar with in the 700 years she had been mistress of the gate. The opening transformed again to reveal three very excited figures, each about 15 centimetres tall, fluttering on sparkling gossamer wings at a height to meet Clara's eyes. Welcome, Pixies, please, come on in. The three tiny figures fluttered through the portal. As soon as they entered the cafe, their heads snatched left and right, up and down, taking in their surroundings and chattering between themselves. Hmm, we definitely need the troops on this one. I'll say it's a good long while since this place has seen a pixie level clean. We might even have to bring in the reserves. <coughs> Clara interrupted their chatter before they became so focused they could no longer hear her. Note 3. A focused pixie is truly something to behold. If Industrious was a picture, it would be a pixie deep into cleaning mode. Whilst a wonder to see, once the cleaning fever takes hold, there is no going back or communicating with pixies until the job is done. A word, please, before you start. I have one rule, no matter what you might believe. None of these wonderful trinkets are rubbish. They all stay Please scrub, reorganise and tidy away until your hearts are content, but none of it goes. The three pixies filled the room with her chatter again, clearly not pleased at the restrictions put on them, refining their plan of attack to spruce up the old cafe without the use of a skip. Clara considered offering further input, but she knew that the pixies were now too far gone and would just ignore her. So she stepped back, found a spot close to the door which would allow her to watch for any errant pixies who might get curious about the world outside the shop, poured herself a cup of tea and watched the experts at their work. Before long, a small army of fluttering little beings flowed through the portal. Clara made an attempt to count the pixies in, but the hordes of swift-moving little bodies made it impossible. In a haze of activity, the shop was transformed into an organised, sparkling space Clara hardly recognised. Now, a certain type of pixie will gladly pop in and work their clean-up magic just for the satisfaction of leaving a shine on your toilet bowl, but Clara could not allow herself to be in debt to these tiny, industrious creatures, nor could she allow them to get into the habit of crossing through the curtain realm portals just for the fun they would get from a bit of scrubbing. If you are now saying, oh, that's not fair, I would love some help cleaning my bedroom. You have obviously never owed a pixie a favour. Note 4. Having owed a pixie a favour myself, before I knew better, I can second this. Let's just say if you don't want to pay for your bedroom spring clean by having your eyebrows dyed bright purple in your sleep, then pay the pixie. Pay that pixie. Okay, so I, I love that reading by Kay, actually. I need more readings by Kay. Don't, Kay, don't get enough readings from Kay. So I'm just going to give you a slightly expanded summary uh, from the Genius Room because we're, we're not picking up everything by any means at the moment, flashing on the screen. It'll be sorted out next week, no doubt, possibly even be sorted out by a quick reboot, but there's no such thing as a quick reboot here. Johnny likes the title. 
LA doesn't land title. LA also says sandwich makes me think of sandwich. I thought the same thing too. Uh, John says sandwich, ham or cheese? Um, yeah, I, I, it's a funny, funny way to start that, I thought. And um, I was thinking sandwich and I was also thinking about a character out of uh, Lord of the Rings too. Um, comfort toys, says Barbara. I dread to ask. And yes, yeah, you're not the only one with that sort of mind. Um, Annie Summerlee says the title doesn't quite stand out enough. And I think that's true. It's interesting. It's kind of it's a little bit off centre, but... I, I agree. Matt says, uh, like the title, but again, really edit the blurb, please. Azuka says, a house moves. This is a reference to the blurb. Makes me think of Monster House. And I was actually wondering about that when I was reading it. Um, Lex says, harsh lesson, harsh lesson there. If someone reading your blurb trips on it repeatedly, it needs to be taken back to formula. And he says, blurb is a mess. Read it out loud. That's a great, uh, you know, a great piece of advice, actually. Just read it. Edit the blurb, shouts L.A. Thomas. Karen says, blurb confused me, meaning story elements mentioned not clear. Um, the story underneath the poor edit, says Matt, looking on the bright side, sounds fun. Uh, just doesn't feel fresh and new to me, says Pamela. James says, story sounds interesting, but blurb needs to tighten. And Carol raises the question, is 11 too old to be just leaving behind comfort toys? Discuss that. Um, LA says, uh, there's someone with the smoothest voice ever on a podcast I listen to. It'd be great to add him to the list of readers. I, who is that? And I just can't tantalise us like that. I love Kay's readings, as Barbara. Oh, I know. And like I said, oh, we haven't heard Kay forever. Yay! Um, reading blurb, I wonder, is there a story arc at all to the characters that itemise adventures, says Carol? And uh, it's, they're really getting ahead of steam now. I can't read everyone. I'm just going to skip ahead. I think we're going to be talking about this in a moment. Eva says, notes, says footnotes are clumsy. Uh, we will discuss that. The info could easily be incorporated into the narrative. Azuka says, tiny crafting, but cutting 50% of those, those adjectives wouldn't take away from the story and would let us get to the story faster. Lee. Yes. I gotta say, Nikki, um, congratulations. You know, for a debut writer, this is rich. You know, the world building is clearly very rich. Um, and you know, it's it's brave to start out and put your work out there, especially you know when you're just starting out. So, first of all, well done there because that is a really that is a really big step. Um, I think uh, fragments. I think you tried to use some fragments in your blurb, and they don't really work there unless you. Um, Unless it's sort of a high action scene, they, they really leave those for, for places where you just need to say things quickly. I don't know who spoke first here, and it doesn't sound to me, it's not your main character. So I think I would, you know, if, you, if you're setting up your back cover blurb as your character's name is Sam Witch, I think, or Samich or something like that, <laughs> Sammy, um, start with your character. D you know, don't start with some 700 year old person talking about cleaning. Uh, 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 kids yeah. really interested in cleaning um, yeah. I think that maybe you just started your story um, a little bit like our previous submission you've started your story in the role plays I like the idea that pixies are dangerous and you should not make a pact with a pixie but let's hear that from let's hear that from our protagonist point yeah. of view rather than from some you know some other part of the magical realm which can come later um, I just felt that we were in the wrong head for for a middle grade story this you know talking about burgundy curtains and cups of tea is kind of you know it's kind of not the the kind of the kind of you know um, the the kind of action that's going to start to get the juices running for a reader of a middle grade text. Mm. So I just think maybe think about who your target audience is and lean into that. I think your writing is very strong mm. for a, a, for a, for a new writer. I think there's lots of potential there, and I, I feel the same as the people in the in the genius room. Not sure about those footnotes. Great, great to try something innovative as a new writer um, yeah. because it is hard to, to have a point of difference, but I'm not sure that works. It just kind of jumps us out of the story. Yeah. So um, maybe think about that. I have seen it done and I have seen it done successfully, but for slightly older older readers. Um, and I think, and, and who is, you need to think about who is the author of those footnotes. Is that you or is mm. that a character in the story? So if mm. that is some kind of, uh, you know, academic wizard or something like that that's putting those those footnotes in and telling the story, you know, alongside, then maybe that's interesting. But mm. for the moment, it just jumps us out of the story. 
Yeah, I, uh, this is a middle grade, which is sort of 8 to 12 age, and I just wonder whether 8 to 12s are really very interested in footnotes, actually. Maybe they are, mm. but maybe they're not. Let's just see what the genie eye is saying. James says, I just turned into a pixie. <laughs> Uh, Johnny says, I quite enjoyed that. And, you know, I think that's right. I think this is the sort of submission, actually, Nicole, that probably is going to get underestimated by people like me and publishers. But actually, you know, you, you sit a nine-year-old down, and I think they're going to really enjoy it. Um, but it hasn't quite got those commercial sort of knobs and whistles that's going to um, attract the, the, the interest at the moment of a publisher or agent. Um, what else? PC Frontier says, I think Nicole's writing is more suitable for adults than teenagers. There's too much cleaning, <laughs> which is what Lee said. In the start for me, um, PJ says, I feel like I'm in a TV commercial land where cleaning is an obsession for every female on the planet. Well, that would be back to the 80s, wouldn't it, really? Um, to become a commercial really needs to show us a different kind of worldview and different magic, says PJ goes on. Pixies are a bit Disney-fied. Middle grade needs to be edgier. And Christina says, oh, yeah, the last line would be a great opening line. Zuko, I enjoy the voice of this writing. I think there's a voice there too. Um, I don't understand what Lex has just written. <laughs> But it's not unusual, actually. It happens quite a lot. Uh, Azuka says, all right, but the Pixies and Artemis Fowl are not Disney, and that one's excellent. Middle grade. Good model to copy. Bev. Um, everything Lee said, we, the, the doily got We're it right. We're not going to agree all the time, are we? It's not going on those shows. Everyone just well, agrees with everyone else. Oh, I think you're absolutely right, Lee. Yes, Bev, how uh, nice. <laughs> I know, the, the, but the thing that I, I found it quite confusing, actually, because so at the beginning, where was Samage? And suddenly we were Clara, and Clara was trying to imagine an 11 year old mean girl. So I thought, oh, she's that age. And then she said she was 700. So I'm thinking, okay, who, mm -hmm. what's going on? And she called it a shop, and then she called it a cafe. And it was like, which is it? And then there seemed to be three curtains, and it was like, there's a burgundy velvet. And then behind that is a black red rectangular panel. And then behind that was a beaded wooden curtain. And I was starting to get a bit lost. And I didn't want all the cleaning because it felt like if you've got pixies that can come through a portal, mm. give, give me something more magical and more exciting than that to kick what, what off. What pixies? What? Well, making them clean your toilet. I mean, that just, it, I don't think it's high on the list of what 10 year olds consider what pixies are for. If I was 10 years old and a pixie came through my portal, I'd definitely send it to, to the toilet for a, a quick brush up. Absolutely, yeah. That's all right. Oh, we're on the subject of weird, Pete. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Okay. Touche. So. So for me, there was a bit of a mismatch between what was actually being written and the the NG audience it was intended for. And I think there's probably a really good story, but it's kind of hidden in there. Yeah, uh, and it's and a bit dysentering, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I think so. I think it's take a step back and have a real think about what are the things that are going to hook yeah. uh, and start bringing them front and centre. Yeah, I think that's right. It was going to be more commercial. Uh, we do need to have a, uh, a many, many, many discussion on footnotes uh, in favour or uh, against. I, I didn't like them. I liked them a lot in many things, but I didn't like them in this because I didn't see the, the real reason why they were footnotes rather than included as part of what was being said. I couldn't say that either. Yeah. I, yeah. I couldn't see why they had to be separate and it just jumped you out and then pushed you back again and it made yeah. it disjointed. So I didn't think it was um, doing its job, basically. Yeah. And Johnny says, when pixies come through your toilet, that's when you really have to worry. Okay. Well, I just want Johnny knows about that. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to ask how. Let's look at the numbers. You've got a 54 there. A bit of a curate's egg, really. I think, uh, Nicole, hopefully you found that useful. I'll just go back one more time to the genius stream because the, uh, through the magic of technology, of course, you can just freeze frame stuff and read every single word. This is one of the beauties of pop-ups. Every single word that the genii have said. Uh, don't take their name in vain. It's well worth reading everything they say. And you have got a 54. Got a 54. I'm going to write that down. 
I hope you're pleased with that. I hope you're pleased with the feedback. Um, can I ask a question if you're on YouTube right now? Don't hide behind the sofa. Ask questions. Now, this is interesting. Are we going to get a bit of non-fiction? I love non-fiction. I, I cut my teeth on non-fiction. I love it. We don't get enough of it. But I'm sorry, that title is so, so small. Because <laughs> what he does, he shrinks the type, uh, the type uh, the font down, type size down, to fill the allotted space. And I think what we've got here, actually, from Guy is both a title and a subtitle that squeeze them to the the line in the submission form that says title. So I'm going to have to read it to you because unless you're watching in HD, you probably can't read that. So the title is The Economics of Kindness, colon, 247, interesting number, 247 ways to end the economics of selfishness and build an economy that works for all and for nature too. So that's, I think that's the title and the subtitle I'll roll up in one. It's from Guy, it's non-fiction, and I'm going to read you Guy's blurb. Why is our world in such a mess? Guy Dauncey has discarded all possible answers, save one. It's because we fashioned our economies around selfishness, which governs the way we operate our banks, businesses, and investments, the way we teach economics, and the way we treat nature. The Economics of Kindness reveals how we can heal our world by reshaping our economies around kindness. Fortunately, over hundreds of years, people have been building the foundations for just such an, an economy. I'm going to tell the world about you, Guy. I'm an author, organizer, a practical utopian. A practical utopian. That's very good. Who works to build a positive vision of a sustainable future. I've been vegetarian for 55 years, vegan for three. Good for you. Yes. <laughs> there are lots of us around, you know. Um, I lived in England until 1990 when I migrated to Canada following a speaking tour. I live in Vancouver Island, British Columbia. I'm a founder of the BC Sustainable Energy Association, co-founder of Prevent Cancer Now, founder of the West Coast Climate Action Network. For my sins, I am... Oh, I can't stand it when people say that. It's such a cliche. Don't say that. Take that out. For my sins, I'm an honorary member of the Planning Institute of BC, a member of the Great Transition Initiative, a fellow of the Fintorn Foundation, cabbages, giant cabbages, excellent, uh, and a fellow of the Royal Society for the Arts. I'm the author of 10 published books. My motto, if it's not fun, it's not sustainable. All right, and you've got a website there, which I think we've got a link to. Actually, no, you didn't fill that form in. Okay, it's www.thepracticalutopian.ca. And while we're figuring out how to get there, we're going to listen to this impeccable reading from Ali. The Economics of Kindness by Guy, read by Alison. 247 ways to end the economics of selfishness and build an economy that works for all and for nature too. Our world needs more kindness. People need more kindness. Nature needs more kindness. But we need it deep within our economies where so many of our troubles begin. We've been told a thousand times that the free market economy is the best and indeed the only type of economy that works. But for so many people it's no longer working. Surely there must be a better way. Our economies have been built on the primacy of selfishness and greed. What is the alternative? The economics of kindness. And it's not just an idea, it's a very real thing. Every day brings a new story of climate disaster or ecological loss, of racial injustice or unaffordable housing, of people's cost of living struggles, or the luxurious tax avoidance of the wealthy. How to make sense of things? The billionaires are having a field day, while billions are struggling. We need, as the French economist Thomas Piketty writes, a profound transformation of the world economic system. We've entered a period of rapid change, but which way will things go? Will they go towards growing resentment, extremism, intolerance, authoritarianism, and the twilight of democracy? Or will a unified wave of resistance blast open the windows of opportunity and permit people to forge a new era of social justice, affordable housing, climate change, and strengthened democracy? We need bold political and economic changes, and these decades, the 2020s and 2030s, are when they must happen. I stubbornly believe we can turn things around, that we can transform the economy, we can build a better world. 
How can we despair when most people have yet to grasp what a better future looks like and most communities have hardly begun to implement the myriad solutions that are available? It is like saying, no, I can't finish this marathon when you've only run 200 yards. I'm not writing for the cynics or doomers. I'm writing for everyone who holds faith that a better world is possible. I'm of one mind with Sergio Fajardo, the former mayor of Medellin in Colombia, and his colleague Alejandro Echeverri, when they were working to transform their city from a hell of drugs and violence into a civic wonder. Pessimism is an indulgence. Orthodoxy is the enemy of invention. Despair is an insult to the imagination. This is not some delusional dream. The economy we need is already being built in workers' cooperatives, public banks and benefit cooperations, in community mutual aid initiatives, in ecological farms and fisheries, in wetlands restorations, in indigenous struggles to reclaim their rights and cultures, in eco-villages and solar farms, in resistance to fossil fuel pipelines and old growth forest logging. People all around the world are busy working to build a world based on cooperation and kindness. My intention in this book is to weave their efforts into a tapestry that will inspire you with its rainbow colours of change. Given the frequency of climate disasters and the speed at which nature is being destroyed, there is a critical urgency to this work. In addition to transforming the economy, we must build resilience against the coming climate disasters and we must prepare for the next financial crash, which will bring a surge in unemployment, debt, evictions and anger. We must inspire people to unite to build a better future if we fail, we risk a repeat of the 1920s and 1930s, when resentful people gave their loyalty to fascist bullies and strongmen, rather than to those who were building a more just society. To prepare for this book, I first needed to answer the question being by millions of people every day. Why is our world in such a mess? A thousand philosophers have offered a thousand answers, yet the mess gets worse with each passing month. After seven years of concentrated reading of economics and economic history, I've thrown out all possible answers save one, which is embarrassingly simple. No long words, no complicated multifactorial explanations, no postgraduate degrees needed. The reason why our world is in such a mess is because we have fashioned our economies around selfishness rather than kindness. Thank you, Ali. Good as always. Um, so I'm just going to spend a slightly longer with the genius room because we, we are getting some uh, comments uh, to flash up and all of them. Um, Jan says, I like the title, Economics of Kindness. Likes that. Uh, Carol says, title and taglines, intriguing. So yeah, you've got uh, a positive reaction so far. Eva, Eva says, just the first line is good enough for a title. That's praise indeed, actually. Um, Lex says, that title is the entire Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> There's 50,000 chapters there. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a mistake, I think. Pamela Joe says, I really enjoyed Blink. Yeah, there's a like comparison there. It's, I, that's Gladwell, isn't it? I think it's Gladwell. A uh, new view of economics. If this can be done as well, it could have potential. More people need to understand economics. And Annie says, we don't know who you are, so make sure you say profession, in brackets, profession. Guy don't see something now while you're writing this for you. And Matt built on that, really. He says, to put forth this sort of book, I feel like the bio needs more gravitas. And Annie carries on says, I feel the blurb needs more of a bang at the end. And Johnny's picking up some buzzwords. He says, going forwards, key takeaways, leverage. Yeah, he says. Um, Barbara, then uh, the mood changes a little. I think it's fair to say that the oh hello guy, nice to have you with us. Very nice, and nice to have you. Glad I just saw you there. Um, so Barbara says beginning is stating the obvious, and Carol says good points. We need bold political and economic changes now, and selfishness and greed are at the root of many of our problems. Unfortunately, too often human nature are not new or unique to point out. Um, and he says, might be better to start with anecdote hookers and give us the lecture. Yeah, so Johnny, well meaning, but where's the incentive to read it? And that is a big question. PJ says, altruism. Altruism used to be a mystery of economics. More recently, it's been discussed as what made Homo sapiens develop more than Neanderthal. And Carol says, how is something, Carol's getting 
interest very much into this actually lots of comments from carol how something specific do you propose to inspire people to make choices for the benefit of others rather than themselves first and james says oh the essential question how to force you people to adhere and izuku says not writing to the cynics preaching to the choir how then will the book change anything mal says feels like a political speech that's not a good thing uh, Bob says, we need something different that we don't know, I haven't thought of before. And Annie says, not my genre, but it's boring. Oh, dear. Nothing's really standing out. And James says, reader needs to know author's qualifications up front. And Jan, who we started with, says, I'm in with this concept and will cheer on a world economy based on kindness. But I'm struggling to see how this is more than a long article in the Atlantic magazine. All right. Very curious to know what you think, Lee. Yes, well, I have to say I'm a bit of a fan of nonfiction these days and um, have been writing some and, and so I was intrigued to see a nonfiction title come through here. Um, the title is way too long and um, so I agree with some of the people in the genius room. It needs to just be shortened down to something to the, the general thesis of the work. Um, Guy, I, I think you have the credentials. I'm just not sure why we, we need to read this. Because, because your writing doesn't tell us why we must read it. Um, you, you give us a lot of um, cliche and a lot of we must and a lot of lists, but we, we don't have any real hook here. And I think maybe if you expanded on the couple of examples that you popped in there, there was one about a civil, uh, a civic wonder, which I don't know what that is. Uh, I'm, I wanted to know what is this and how does this work? And show me an example which shows that your idea, your thesis of kindness actually works and therefore, you know, why we should start reading this book text about how to do it. Um, things, things like I stubbornly believe just completely turn me off. All of the, the, the um, I think it's a thing in fiction, you know, when you see a lot of superlatives in a row, we just stop believing, you know, yeah. it's like, yeah. We're words like bigly, you know, we just yes. stop believing what's well, being I like said. Bigly. You, can, you so, can use that as often as you um, want. Bigly's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe just pull that back. I mean, obviously you've written other other nonfiction books, so you must know what works. And I think perhaps you've just got a little bit passionate about your topic here. And it's a topic that really does have interest. I mean, it's it's mm. what our former Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern based mm. her whole political career on is let's be kind people. And it mm. and it really has worked here in New Zealand. So maybe some examples like that, this is a new wave of of thinking amongst political leaders would help your thesis this read to me this introduction as an author note you know and i and i think i want to know what your thesis is and why i should be reading this book up front yeah. and it needs to not have these cliches and not have these lists rainbow colors of change i i'm sorry i don't know what that means i, I want to yeah. know you know what that means in terms of economic change and and prosperity for for the everyday person does it mean more food on the table does it mean what does it mean really so can you just you know maybe specify and also i saw the word struggles four times and i i want to know what those struggles are not just the word struggles just, mm. i don't know um and perhaps maybe pulling in some other things like some poetry or some to show um you know how these things really mean to what these things really mean to people um it, it seems to me this is very personal and i wonder if you maybe look at the messe approach which looks at sort of it kind of meanders a bit which is sort of what i felt this introduction was doing and and brings in some personal things because obviously you've got the cred guys so maybe bring in those personal things that you've learned through the things that you're doing Mm. I'm going to stop talking now. No, you don't have to. I can listen to you all day, actually. Um, please just tell, me, just tell me another 10 minutes, which is so lovely listening to you. Um, but I'm going to go to the genius room. Uh, Izuku has got quite a lot to say, actually. A guy, guy has too. We are going to come back to Guy in a moment because it's great to know you with this actually guy. Izuku says, feels like an introduction instead of the first chapter. 
no, he's on to the rant. I had our, our arguments, which is just what he was saying. We must change in the 2020s and 2030s. Why then? We, the readers, must have con concrete examples and data. We must have tangible action items we can accomplish. Otherwise, this is a philosophy book. <gasps> and Carol says, like the idea that kind of... Carol's really active. She likes... She's behind you, I think. I like the idea that kindness can be nurtured and applied in practical impactful ways to create real change and progress towards end goals. Be specific by showing several hundred ways this can and is being done uh, will be interesting to read. Um, Eva says it sounds so preachy. We need a new approach to this. And PC Frontiers reads more like a political pamphlet than a book to me. I suggest Guy starts with his best idea and then provides his evidence. Mm-hmm. Bev. Um, I wrote TED Talk without the engaging graphics. Oh, it is a bit Teddy, uh, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought also he repeated himself a bit, as in, I thought the last two bits where he said, I spent seven years preparing for this, and then I, I realized there's only one solution, and this is it. I thought, actually, that's all we need at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Give me that. Yeah. And then hit me with... What I can do. And I yeah. thought 247 is a very strange number. Um, it kind of sticks in uh, the mind. I just wonder, has he got sort of occult significance, know. do you think? Because oh, I will remember I that, think. 247. It's like round it up to 250 or like I felt daunted at the idea that I would have to read 247 different ways to try and work hmm. through what I as a person could do. So I'm okay. like, give me the top... Give me the top 50, and then if that's successful, give me 50 more in another book. You know, I mean, you could keep this going. Um, and, yeah, I marked the title low because you can't even see it on the screen there. No, well, that's just, uh, to be you know. honest, I mean, I think that's the way that it was yes. submitted. I, I think the guy, yeah. you, you know, it should have just, I mean, the economics of kindness is not a bad title. But no, I quite like that, just, and I also like the, the practical well. utopian. Yeah. 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 You know, but I, yeah. I think even the subtitle was a bit too long. Yeah. Um, 247, we see Pamela Joe says 247 ways to save the world. Well, that's that's quite engaging. I mean, are you saying, are you saying, Bill, actually 247 is a number you can't cope with? I, f I did find it very daunting. I just thought, oh, gosh, that's a lot to have to take on and read. Right. I, yeah. It's just like how I felt that title put me in information overload before I'd even picked it up. <laughs> Basically, it radio I, ones or know, old it, medium wave it, frequency before FM. That's probably why oh. it sticks in my mind, actually. Oh, oh why? Wow. Yeah, so guy um, is busy, busy, busy telling your stuff. He's feeling very defensive now. He feels unjustly attacked. I know how you feel, guy, but you, you're a brave guy for sticking this in here. Yeah. Um, the different ways are actually all in the appendix. There are legislative changes. The examples of how it works in practice. Okay. Yeah, I'm but sure so make, reflect that in the title and make it sort of up front and centre in how you describe the book yeah. and how you format it. Because we're yeah. getting a bit lost in wordage at the beginning. And I marked high for Bang because I think the idea of this and the reason he's doing it and what he's trying to do are, are great. You did, yes. Absolutely yeah, you're all behind great. him. Okay. Um, absolutely, but this maybe is not the way to sell us on those ideas. It's, yeah. it's, it, yeah. All right, guys, defensively, a guy has said he's not feeling defensive at all. <laughs> all right? Get that straight, Peter. Good heavens. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's us to told. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love polemics. Um, I, um, I've, I'm, I'm, you know, I, guy, I did write a polemic, actually. That's how I got into this very strange business, and it happened to, uh, to do extremely well. Um, and it's, it's something that has always stayed very, very close to, to my heart, actually. So I love polemics. And I think that's one of the great things about book publishing, actually, that they do. It gives you a way to change people's lives and change their... Yeah, you are a good sport guy. Sorry about that. Merciless teasing. So what you're trying to do is a great thing. Um, it's important. So there yeah. are two. There are two ways you can basically take polemics. One is uh, the way that most, most of them go in any case, which is preaching to the choir. That's not a total waste of time, because if you're informing people who are kind of on your side in any case and motivating them, that's a good thing, actually. You're giving them tools and, uh, and, and good motivation. But the other interesting way is kind of people don't count on the fringe, you know, it's a little bit of converting going on. 
And that's, that's what I did uh, some years ago, quite effectively, actually. Um, and that's very interesting, too. So if you, you, know, you broaden your net as, as wide as you can, you can certainly hit both of those. Um, I think you have identified the problem. I don't know how you're going to solve it, actually. And that's what we need. You, how, how are you going to tackle that? You're trying to take us from a selfish society. That would be the British Prime Minister today changing the national grid in the UK so that he can supply more electricity to his personal residence, residence to heat his own swimming pool, right? Because he needs more electricity for that at the same time as there are people who actually can't afford to pay their electricity bills and get heating. So we're taking it from selfishness to kindness. That's an interesting transition. How can we do that? Because the selfish people kind of run things at the moment. So I'm very curious to know what your recipe is for that. Um, and hopefully it's not just, you know, change the brand of underwear you buy or something like that. Let's look at the numbers. You got a 52. How to solve it? That's in the detail of the chapters. Okay, when well, you're tantalizing me, you're teasing me, guy. But I, I believe you've got a 52, and you've got high marks for certain things like Barbara, for example, commercial appeal, and low marks. Oh, sorry, Bev, I mean, oh, I've said that before, haven't I, Bev? I, I've, I've, I've called you Barbara before, actually. I'm losing my marbles. But the title you got extremely low, so there you go. I hope some of that's useful. Tell us if it is. Tell us if I'm talking complete rubbish. And meanwhile, I think we should speak to Lee again, actually. Um, no, there's so much happening in Lee's <laughs> busy world. I know, I know. So much happening in your busy world. Um, what we're going to do is we've got, we haven't done this for a few weeks now, but we are going to do it right now. book.letypia.com that link changes according to what book we're recommending and, and we're recommending a hardback version of this we have talked about a little bit before called black cranes book.letypia.com that will take you straight through to the buy page just tell us briefly about uh, about that book lee because i want to talk to you about something else as well Oh, um, that book has just come out in a new hardback edition. It's looking beautiful um, because the original publisher closed. It's oh, one okay. of the, <laughs> so you one of the um, downsides. Of, yes, and oh, it's cool. now moved to um, Raw Dog Screaming Press in the United States, which is a boutique oh, publisher, and yeah. they do horror and speculative. Yeah. So, um, yes, and it's really exciting to have it back on the market again. Oh, so that comes so out on in March of the 23rd. So, so it's been a groundbreaking book for me with uh, one of Bram Stoker and a Shirley Jackson and a British fantasy nomination and a couple of other nominations. Yeah. So it's done very well. So we're really pleased to have it out. And it has a new afterward by Nancy Holder, who, of course, is you know, wrote some of those uh, Buffy novels, uh, yeah. Buffy the, the vamp yeah, Vampire yeah. Slayer. So she's yeah, yeah. Um, quite a feminist voice. So it's wonderful to have that. Yeah. Okay, so something else uh, that you are, have done, um, and I had no idea you were doing this, actually. Uh, the Fidget Film Grafted, you're the lead, lead writer for that. Um, it's apparently it's in mm -hmm. final pre-production now, um, and it'll be airing. When will it be airing? I mean, tell us all about it. What What is it? I haven't heard I don't know it. when it will be airing. It's uh, it's going into production next week, so the filming oh. starts next week. Um, mm -hmm. And I just went to Auckland for a cast read uh, with all the with all the cast a couple of days ago, so that was really exciting. I'm learning so much. Um, I thought you just wrote a script, and then it became a movie, and in fact, you write 50 scripts, yeah. and they evolve, <laughs> and it's very organic, and it changes all the time, and so yeah. I'm learning so much it's, it's fascinating and of course it's not like writing a novel which we where we show everything it's it's yeah. you know it's it's tell it in an engaging way and in a way that the director can actually you know film it it was it's uh, very it's been very exciting so it's a an asian kiwi weird science body horror type yeah. movie so it's horror so it's horror man, it's um, very exciting so it's yeah. uh, uh, what's all the new straight? zealand cast is it going to get a theatrical release, do you think, or uh, streaming or what? Any idea? I, I don't know. Um, I believe some big distributors have picked it up. So pretty Good. exciting um, for us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the comments, comments about uh, Black Crane. Lots of good comments. So this is where you want to go, guys. And while you do that, while you do that, I think we shall... We should have a look at another submission, should we not? 
Thank you. Thank you, Guy. It's nice of you to say that. I mean, I'll be able to sleep okay tonight. I don't like to think we have ruined people's lives. <laughs> this is from Liz. It's called Conspiracy is Historical Fiction. We like that. This is the blurb. After the sinking of the white ship and the loss of three of his favourite children, including his only legitimate male heir. Henry I, King of England and Duke of Mor Normandy, sends his mistress, Isabel of Beaumont, to Shaftesbury Abbey. I was there just a few days ago. As penance, at least where it used to be, as penance for their sins. Henry intends Isabel to become a nun until her 19-year-old brother, the greatest landowner in Normandy, rebels and he finds another use for her. Sounds ominous. Liz has got... Are you with us at the moment, Liz? Give us a shout if you're... Liz has got MA in Creative Writing from Royal Holloway College, University of London, and I am fortunate, says Liz, to enjoy the feedback, support and advice of two writing groups. Conspiracy Still in Draft is my fourth unpublished novel inspired by the medieval Earls of Warren, or Varen. Is that Varen? I think it might be. Um, its predecessor, Concubine, I think I prefer that title, actually, like that word. <laughs> Some sort of vegetable. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's cucumber. Um, is currently being submitted to agents. I'm a retired accountant, a passionate historian, and a regular visitor to Lewis in Sussex, where the Varenne built their first English castle. Isabel was the stepdaughter of the second Earl and the only one of King Henry's mistresses to be named with any certainty. Her role in conspiracy is entirely my invention. Good, so she's not going to see you for that, is she? Possibly, who knows? Lawsuits from the dead, eh? Well, uh, <laughs> while we conjure with that weird uh, fantasy of my own that I've just invented at this moment, let's hear from Barbara. <laughs> Conspiracy by Lise Brown, read by Barbara. Chapter 1. Shaftesbury Abbey, 6th of May, 1123. I suck in the honey-scented air flowing through the narrow gap between the ceiling and the wall, ignoring the stale smell of my own flesh and the ache in my ribs. Breathing it out, I take another lungful, filling my cramped chest to its utmost. My mind drifts on to the costless pleasures of summer, how I might not see another and my desperate need for escape. Three weeks after Easter Sunday, and I have done my two years as a penitential novice. Soon I will lose any claim to a life outside. I will disappear as if I had never existed, just as Henry promised. A blue bottle has crept through the gap and is banging around trying to find its way out. That's me. I am that fly. The door slams open, bouncing against the wall. Isabel! You lazy slut! What are you doing just lying there? Sister Margot gives a hard slap on my arm. The same place. Always the same place. If I move it away, she will grab it and hit me twice as a punishment. Where's your veil? Margot is not the pleasantest or most patient of women, even in a good mood. Handed to the nuns by an unknown mother half a century ago, I don't think she has ever been outside the convent walls. Certainly, she's never known a man. Now, something has upset her badly. Her mouth twists with malice as she spits out the words, You've a visitor! Without bothering to wipe her spittle off my habit, I seize my scarf and wrap it neatly around my head without a word of complaint. I don't want to be punished. Not her sneaky underhand punishments, or the more severe ones handed out by the abbess. Who is she, Sister Margot? I say. No man is entertained here. With another twist of her mouth, the nun kicks my sandals behind her, the solid barrel of her body putting them out of my reach. I hardly care. My bare feet with their cracked and filthy nails are so calloused I no longer feel the cold of the earth floor. Aiming another blow at my spine, she shoves me out of the, my cell towards the abbess's quarters, somewhere I haven't been since my arrival. The door is opened carefully and I am pushed inside. It closes gently. Henry, prowling back and forth like a caged beast as I have seen him do so often. King Henry, I should be on my knees. I drop clumsily, my head bowed to the reed bundles on the floor even before he turns. Is he here to announce that my novitiate is complete? That I am to take my vow as a nun? Or is he to children? I raise my head. He's glaring down at me, his eyes like pebbles. What have I done wrong? How oh, I hate this man. 
I bait back that familiar name. I must not call him Henry. Your Grace, the children? There's nothing wrong with the children. Stand, woman! With my hands flat on the floor, I push myself up and almost fall. My haste, my fear, make me clumsy. And he has changed. The silver almost eclipses the walnut in his hair. Still powerful, yet he seems hollowed out, and the bow of his legs from the incessant riding is more obvious. His face is creased with misery, and there are dark shadows around his eyes. As I study him, surreptitiously from under lowered lids, so he studies me. Take your whale off, he gives a disgusted sniff. You used to smell of roses. Don't they let you wash? When I first came into the convent, they cut off my thick plates. Even to think of it now makes my lips tremble. My hair has grown back, but where once it reached my waist, now it would not even cover my breasts if ever I were allowed to expose them. I untie my scarf and lift my chin, not daring to meet his gaze. Still beautiful, he sighs, paces away from me and back again. I have a job for you. Terrific stuff, Barbara. Just terrific. Thank you very much for that. And uh, now I, I will attempt to um, praise you, which I'm a total failure. I can never praise you what the genie is saying. Because uh, they're geniuses and you, you, can't, you can't condense genius. If you could, they would have canned it and sold it. Uh, Jan says, I lean in on any conspiracy, but maybe add a word or two and love this blurb. Okay, Christina, intriguing blurb. I like the last line about finding another use for it. Concubine was a brand of cigars, wasn't it, says Johnny. We're not going to go down that route. Um, Carol says, saying their sins confused me versus saying Isabel's sins. Mm, yeah, I'd pick that up too. Uh, Pamela says, need a title that gives us white ship. Conspiracy could be anything. I hate conspiracy personally. I just, it's just so totally unforgettable. We'll talk about that in more a moment. Uh, Johnny says, it's a generic title. I like the fly detail, says Annie. Good blurb, says Carol, except last, but he finds another use for her, threw me off. Use? What's that mean? Um, LA says, blurb sort of suggested Henry was the main character. Nice hooky start, says PJ. Eva, who knows what she's talking about, definitely does. I won't say how I know, but I know that she knows. Uh, lazy slut, quote, that's not nun's language, ever. <laughs> okay. Um, did nuns in 1123 talk like that, says Azuku. I'm not a historian. Asking the more knowledgeable. I don't think they did, but it's an interesting discussion that to what extent you should modernise language. Um, Barbara, I like this. Uh, our narrator, of course. Good sense of character. I would read on very important. Annie, writing's good. Feels like the right place to start. Great reading, Barbara, says Jeff. LA says, sorry, I'm a bit, bit behind. Pizza arrived. Okay. Uh, Annie, that being said, it feels a bit too modern. Okay, maybe it does, actually, language. Maybe throw in a few more historical words there now, maybe, uh, to give us a 12th century atmosphere. Pamela Jo, I like you already get the precarious position of a woman made a mistress, but only a pawn. I would read on says James. Um, Annie would read on. Is Zuka a great place to stop? I'd read on. I'm intrigued. Matt says, well done. Um, and I don't know what... Oh, I know. That's, that's a reference to something I said. Yeah, okay. Uh, Johnny, if the parlance becomes too modern, it can bump a read out, says Johnny, and absolutely can do. And I see from uh, YouTube, good, good blurb, great submission. PC Frontier says, I like the writing. Sets the scene well. Good description. Well done from me. A good start, Bev. Oh, I loved it. Um, I only have two issues, really. One, one is the title, which says thriller. It doesn't say historical no. fiction to me at all. And I think, and you need it to. And from what you've said about the story, there must be so much there that you could draw on to make a really engaging title and titles are you know once once this gets to an agent and a publisher they're all gonna give you other ideas for titles so i wouldn't get too upset that this isn't the right title yeah. um uh even in my grandmother's day she used to use the word slut to mean someone who didn't do the housekeeping properly uh -huh. so so um you know i know use is usage has changed it's probably an old uh, word actually isn't it? it sounds old i think it probably is an old word but mm. um for for me it was for my granny it was if you didn't dust properly she would write slut in the dust no. and that's yeah seriously mm. uh you know so that's 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 what it meant in my grandma's day so um language that does feel too modern does jump me out 
a little bit, but I would have read on and on and on because I just wanted to know more. I just thought, yeah, you, you've hooked me in. Mm. I'm with this person. I'm feeling what they're feeling. I loved the blue bottle coming in and she going, I am that fly. And then the nun smacking her on the arm and she said, the same place, always the same place. Mm. And there were just these lovely little Sadistic, details that, that, that told character in, in like five words. So for me, that was, uh, you know, that's what I want. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Izuka says uh, it's a bit long, so because uh, it always gets, you know, uh, Genie, if you are going to start doing anything more than one or two sentences, just doing two two comments so it doesn't get ludicrously shrunk down. Oh, there you go. Uh, something key for me with historical fiction. I need to trust that it's somewhat historical. Yeah. So key bits, get bits need to be real. Setting, dialogue, social systems. I'm curious why Mistress would feel so entitled and so brazenly think about how she hates God's appointed. Isn't that how many of the lower classes thought of the monarchy? I don't know, but they probably do these days. What did you think, Lee? Well, I didn't agree with anything Bev said except for oh, everything good. that she good. said. Good. Oh, no. <laughs> Agreement has broken out again. Uh, uh. You know, um, uh, yeah. So, um, in terms of the in terms of the title, I'm with on board with everybody else. I think this is just too generic a title, and I think you like the one word titles. Um, so, Liz, so maybe just have another rethink about this. It doesn't. It, it does say thriller to me, rather than rather than historical fiction. Absolutely yeah. loved your your where you started the story. I was a little bit confused about the blurb though. Um, I think it read well, but it uh, yeah, I wasn't quite sure whether it was the brother in Normandy who had the new plan, and I I don't know whether it was just the way that it was worded. I had and so, for some weird reason, I thought the children were dead. She the loss of the children. Maybe that was I can't recall what it was now. Yeah. But for some weird reason, I thought, why is she asking about the children? Aren't the children dead? Isn't she in the convent? Because the, I don't know. I may have just completely missed the ball. You know, missed the 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 key verb there. But um, um, the writing is fabulous. I agree with everyone about the use of the word slut, which may have thrown people out. The register didn't just quite seem right for us in yeah. contemporary times. But um, the hook is perfect. You know, Henry is here for, um, you know, to, to he has a job for her. It straight away ties into the blurb. It's exactly what we need to read. I would have turned the page. Most definitely. Fantastic. Well, a lot of people well say done. that. That's very, very, very good indeed. Let's just see what the genie I are saying. Um, Johnny uh, says Christian Brothers. Uh, knew how, how no, he, Johnny was educated by the Christian brothers, knew how and where to hit us for maximum effect. Yes, Ooh. they they did. I, I had a, a nasty vicar do that to me as well. He, they, he was very, very precise in his aiming, actually. Uh, and Matt says, slut, he's done his research, or he just knows this, actually, because they are genii, after all. Slut comes from 1450, so not too far out of time. And Johnny says, so are you a slut, Matt? And... And that's not telling. Um, Paolo Joe says, Slut comes from slatternly, slatternly, I think. For me, this caught the historical feel very well. Women of the time were phenomenal. There's a battle to put women on the throne very shortly. I thought the children were dead too, says LA. Alex says, Women every time are phenomenal. The problem is getting society to recognise it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So um, we've got some numbers for you. Got a 66, Liz. I think that probably puts you in the lead, actually, doesn't it? I think it does. Let's have a look. It does. It does. Yes, you are in the lead, but we haven't had our final submission today, which we're going to have in a moment. Just before I tell you, of course, that is this Saturday. It's not Sunday. It's this Saturday. The Toby Book Club, under the aegis of the inescapable uh, Jason, it's just worth turning up for Jason, really, isn't it? Um, so if you want to, if you want to take part, you can do. Anyone who's a member of Latopia can do. Just go to club.latopia.com and you'll you see the joining details and the whole thing. And the key thing, of course, is you do need to take a, a look at it. You can get it on Kindle. The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid, and um, it got enormous um, praise and reviews when it was first published. So get into it. 
see what you think to it and tell everybody else um, your opinion, please. Final submission of the day, number five. Daisy Roberts is dead. This is from Claire, a speculative love story. This is Claire's blurb. What would it be like to die young? Only to have to spend the next 50 years watching your loved ones move on without you. And what if you discover that your death wasn't an accident? Daisy Roberts had everything going for her, but she dies suddenly in the opening chapter and spends the rest of her fiancé's lifetime waiting for him. She observes her family's grief, meets fellow ghosts and travels the world and time to escape the pain of life continuing without her. Oh. About Claire, I'm a 40-year-old pop. We haven't had anyone uh, say they are their age so far, but you have done very brave. And we also want to know how many cats people have got too, please. I think we're going to get a little bit of a cat competition on, on this because writers always have cats. Cats are like writers, writers are like cats. I'm a 40-year-old part-time primary school teacher, good for you, with a passion for creative writing. I'm up at 4 a.m. every day typing away. That, to me, is a good sign, actually. It's not a sustainable lifestyle. But you know, while you're you're making that that move, dare I say, transition, it's 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 a marker for me. I've had a number of um, you know authors who who've done very very well, who do lead that lifestyle for time. So that's a good thing to include, I think. Um, I've written several unpublished novels and short stories, and regularly enter competitions. I completed the novel while studying on a selective Curtis Brown creative novel writing course. We're promoting all these novel writing courses today, not endorsing them, but promoting them. Um, and encouraged by constructive feedback from a supportive writing group. I also undertook an intensive rewrite course with MD Anna Davis. What is, is was Anna Dr. Davis or something? I don't know what that is. My aspiration is to write full time. Good. Well, that's a good aspiration, but an even better aspiration that we can fulfill is for this to be read by mail. Daisy Roberts is Dead. Written by Claire. Read by Mel. I don't remember much about my death. A moment of panic. The screeching of tires. An ear-shattering bang. Then, nothing. No bright light. No tunnel. No loved ones waiting to greet me, their faces smiling benevolently as they welcomed me to the afterlife. Just the high-pitched beeping of the traffic lights as they changed signaling to pedestrians that it was now their turn to cross the junction, oblivious to the carnage before them. Later, I would think a lot about those traffic lights, the merciless way they had continued on with their mundane task, unwilling to pause in their relentless routine as they systematically sequenced from red to green and back again, unwilling to show respect for the tragedy which had taken place in front of them. They should have turned black, I thought. Black for mourning, black for death, black for the color my heart turned as the realization hit me that I was no longer alive. But back then, I found myself standing next to my smashed up VW, watching the aftermath of the crash in stunned disbelief. My body was slumped over in the driver's seat, unmoving, sack-like. My head rested limply on the steering wheel. The mass of curly hair on top of it was darkly crimson, blood slick. Rain drummed on the shattered windscreen, incessantly, just inches away from my face, as if it was trying to wake me up. But it was a fruitless task. My body remained limp, unresponsive, dead. I took all this in almost instantly, a snapshot of a cataclysm. The shrill scream of a young woman pierced the air, almost seeming to slice its thick metallic weight in two. It was replaced by a deep, inhuman groaning as she stood just feet away from the site of the impact, staring at the gruesome scene before her. She'd been waiting to cross the road, hunched under her umbrella, a flash of color against a sepia backdrop. She'd been minding her own business, perhaps planning her morning or daydreaming about the man or woman that she'd spent her night with. Then, in an instant, her peaceful reverie was shattered. Her free hand was pressed tightly over her mouth, her eyes inhumanly wide, her breasts rapid. She reminded me of a frightened horse, ready to bolt. 
Much later, I would wonder if she ever had flashbacks to the sight of my lifeless body hunched over the wheel, or if she suffered recurrent nightmares where my caved-in head suddenly turned and looked at her, the eyes bloodshot and staring. But at the time, seeing the young woman's reaction, a creeping sense of horror enveloped me. Help me! I screamed at her, finding my voice at last. As if he'd heard me, the lorry driver's door flung open, bouncing back on him so that he had to catch it before it rebounded fully and hit him, trapping him against the cab. The middle-aged man, ashen and shaking, blood pouring down his face from a nasty gash on the head, which soon mixed with the rain as it ran in rivulets down his face, rushed through the downpour to my car. Oh, God! Oh, Jesus! Oh, Jesus! He repeated it again and again as he leaned against the vehicle after checking my neck for a pulse, as if needing its support to remain upright. Too late. Too damn late. His futile prayer went unanswered. Gradually, a small crowd gathered around the crumpled car, their pale, wet faces under their dripping hoods reflecting shared horror and sorrow. Two men pulled out their phones and turned away, talking into the handsets in low, urgent voices, before standing around with the rest, solemnly, helplessly. A few people approached the stricken lorry driver, quietly, awkwardly, offering comfort and avoiding looking at the young woman resting, motionless, nearby, perhaps secretly relieved that the face was turned away from them. Soon the wailing of a siren could be heard in the distance, growing louder, louder, drowning out the ability of the bystanders to hear each other speak, until the ambulance was suddenly upon us and the blaring cut off abruptly. Everything seemed to pause in the quiet that followed. Thank you, Mel. Another terrific reading from Mel. So much uh, feeling she gets into it. So let me uh, bring you up to speed with the genie eye and uh, Alex is very keen. He, he says, so this is ghost uh, crossed with chiclet. Let's give it a shot. Uh, L.A. Thomas doesn't like the questions in the blurb. Azuka says, something isn't right about this blurb. I don't need to know at which point Daisy dies in the story. Nice title, says Annie. Blurb a bit touch and confusing. I like the title. Uh, sorry, power, uh, PJ said that and Eva likes the title. Matt says, last line of blurb needs a tweak. Fan of the title. So you got general approval for the title there. Blurb doesn't really work, says Annie. Uh, there's no story, just her mopey about as a ghost. What's a stake? What are her goals as a ghost? Ghostly goals. James says, like the title blurb, okay, uh, but may have said um, no, but many have said no questions in blurbs. And Johnny says, yeah, I would leave the first chapter line out of the blurb, sort of fourth wall break. Carol says, I like the title, I uh, thought of the lovely bones. James, don't tell me the opening show. Uh, Jan, good title, blurb reminds me of a ghost story. I'm just going to skip ahead because there's so much good stuff here. Pamela Joe, if there had been more story promised in the blurb, I would be likely to read on. The writing is tight and sharp. And he said, OK, I'm convinced you should start with the woman screeching. This is much more engaging. Uh, Azuka, help me. At first, I thought she already realised she was dead. She took in the scene as an instant and before that mentioned realising she was dead. I need more of her emotionally reacting to this emotional reaction yeah uh, barbara somehow I'm, I'm not getting emotionally involved not sure why well written though shouldn't the main character be panicked uh, more by being dead all great readings this evening says johnny absolutely yeah and he says another well-written submission this one let down by its blurb and izuka says yeah right he is lovely um i don't know where this is going the blurb gave me no exigence neither does this first scene yeah and carol kind of echoes that too lots of action the fast moving scene but not much story yet no hook to read on so <sighs> lee yeah the the there's a reason they call it the genius room isn't there because yeah some they, pretty, they steal our um, thoughts before we have them there. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, um, just going through the things that we normally do, the title, um, I love the title. I just actually think the, the title is fantastic. I really wanted, I want to read a story that says Daisy Hobbits is dead. I just, I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Doesn't quite say speculative, but it, I mean, it sh I guess it should have it's a bit the lovely bones, isn't it? A Jodie Pico sort of story where you 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 trying to solve the problem of your of how you mm. how you, you died and how you can move forward. But I don't. I'm not really getting the urgency here. And I I think 
I don't know. I think maybe it was actually the writing, which is competent for sure. But I think there was just a lot of, there wasn't the emotion of, oh, my God, I'm dead, you know, yeah. there. I didn't quite feel that. And there was, I think part of that was there was just a lot of repetition. Yeah. And and it's you really have to look to see it. But, I mean, for example, we have um, mixed, you know, with the rain, the the, tea, the blood mixed with the rain and it, the rain and rivulets and then in the downpour. So we don't need to know all that so many times yeah. um, and yeah. things like, we continued on and then um, unwilling to, you know, the, the, you know, just, I just unwilling, there was a couple of repetitions of the sentence structure there and also the sense, you know, we, it's, that we're just carrying on, the lights were just carrying on, carrying on, yeah. carrying on. And um, I just think that those kind of slowed down and took away from the emotion of what, what we would, this idea of, oh my God, I'm dead and now what? You know, um, and and again, I think the the genius room was right. Well, where are yeah. the stakes here? Is it a love? How is this a love story? Mm. Um, you know, and and where is the sense of oh my god, my you know, I'm I'm separated from my partner in this first, in this first, mm. in the, you know, in this first scene. Sorry, I'm just not quite getting the speculative. I'm not it, either. Yes, she's a ghost. Yeah, but, and if I don't really care, I mean, yeah. you know, it's a crucial uh, moment, obviously, her death, and if I don't really care about that. I, I, you know, then I'm just wondering how much am I going to care about the rest of the book, really. Um, what did you think, Bev? Yeah. Um, there were highs and lows for me with this. For, uh, the title, fabulous. Um, really, really, that's for me. That's an engaging title. The the blurb. I liked the first two lines. She's dead. Her death was not an accident. Yeah. And that I was like, okay, there's the story. Make tell you know, this is someone who's dead but is now trying to find out who killed. That's great. But then it went on to and she has to she goes away and she navigates this and she does this. And I thought for me that was a red flag because it said waffle. Yeah. And dilution mm. of the possible thread of the story. Mm. So I was like, okay, I'll keep that at the back of my mind so so the blurb for me was a bit i'm not sure um the traffic light bit i just think cut it out altogether because i quite liked the intro i quite liked oh that you, you know i didn't really know what was happening it was so quick bang crash i'm dead mm. then i think go straight to the woman's you know she's standing next to her vw and the woman screaming because by the time we got to the woman screaming it felt like time had gone on too long yeah. for that scream to be in relation to the accident. Yeah. So I would just cut that out. And like Lee said, there are lots of other bits where you could just minimize it and cut it and edit it down. But I liked the, the detachment. I, I know that people were looking for the emotion, but I kind of liked the contrast between her standing there just not feeling anything and simply observing all this weirdness of, yeah. uh, of what was happening while other people were reacting. Okay. Um, and okay. I actually found that quite interesting. Um, yeah, and, and it was very visual. So I found it easy to imagine what people were doing and what they were looking and when they were turning away and sort of embarrassed and looking at their phones and things like that. So yeah. I, th I think it's got I think it's got a lot of promise, but my worry would be that it doesn't quite that it could be unfocused. Yeah, well, it's it's a if you don't mind me saying it's kind of killer first scene, isn't it? Because if we don't if we don't actually get gobsmacked by this, then you know you're putting everything up front there. It's complete front waiting. If we don't get gobsmacked by this, then we're not going to, we're not going to read on. So you've what you've got to do, in my view, Claire. I want, uh, um, actually, Christina on YouTube said more more voice. I agree with that, but I want more intensity. I want I want absolutely riveting prose. Um, I know, uh, yeah, yeah, this is it, to some extent this is a, a scene that's a bit of a cliche. Um, so you've got to, you've got to, you've got to you know unwrap the the newness of this and make us feel like we're really there. Our heart's got to be in our mouth for these these first few pages. I think. And if that's not happening, I mean, I understand what you're saying, Barbara, about, um, oh, slap me with a wet fish. Bev, I understand what you're saying about this. I'm so sorry. But, um... It, it, yeah, it's all right. The genius room don't agree with me either, and that's fine. 
it's it's but good for the for the you know for the author yeah. to see that we do have different reactions yeah. to this. But even 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 you know if if um, Claire was to take it your way, even, that would be a bit of a shock. I mean, it, you know, the, we ex, we expect to have this extraordinary emotional outpouring, and yet everyone else is. But I'm not. I'm just, you know, I'm just. I mean, it's, mm. I'm I'm looking. I'm mm. desperately looking for a, for an, a fresh and original approach to this. And if if it's possible to crack that nut right up front, then I think you've you've mm. got something very strong here. But I don't think it's it's quite working at the moment. Any final thoughts, guys? Yeah. Lee? Oh, no, okay. uh, no, 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 I, I, I did. I'm just <laughs> listening now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Let's look at the numbers. Yeah. You got a 63, Claire. I hope you're pleased with that. And more importantly, I hope you're pleased with the thoughts, comments, and reactions from Lee and from Bev and from the Genius Room, maybe even from me too. Um, that doesn't affect... Anything as far as the show winner is concerned, though. Congratulations, Liz. And we all thought that was great. Historical fiction, very good market for that. I think you're on the right track with that. Let's see if you turn into a monthly winner. You may, you may not. Can I just say thank you very much? Bev, can you... Why do I say Barbara? You know, but did, did you used to call know. Barbara in this life or any um, other? In my French class, yes. They, they, they do, they, do they? Why did they, they do picked, that? They picked French names for all of us, and she couldn't work oh. out, my teacher couldn't work out a French name for Beverly, so I was there Barbara. Yeah, I, I knew that. <laughs> that's, that's what's so going on. So subliminally, yeah, yeah, it's coming in. <laughs> totally, yeah. Uh, but I never can, I never can mistake Lee, of course. So nice to have you back, Lee. And thank you for making time. To you know, to, to make oh. an appearance here amongst all the extraordinary things you get up to. I mean, are you one of these writers who also gets up at four in the morning? Actually, you are, of course, to get on no. pop-ups. No. Only for Latopia, yeah. And oh. I never get up at four a.m. Otherwise, I'm a full-time writer, so you know, I work, I work all the time. You know, it's what I do. So um, I don't need to get up at four a.m. Lucky me. So yeah. uh, except for when I'm on Latopia. Well, I'm glad you get up for us <laughs> because we certainly appreciate having you. We certainly appreciate having you too, Bev, and everyone behind the scenes who makes this possible. And guys, let's do it all again next week. <laughs>